start our feed. And uh, don't be afraid, there might be a horde of children suddenly popping in at one point or another. Our kids should be sleeping, but uh, you all know how that goes. <laughs> all right, uh, did you hit it? I hit it. Okay, cool. Well, uh, let me do a quick intro for everyone who will be watching on my channel, and then I'll jump back into this. So, hey, y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to my shop. Today, I'm actually doing a presentation for the Fox Valley Woodworkers. So, if anyone is in the Fox Valley, anywhere between Chicago and uh, Rockford, um, and uh, the, the suburbs area there, um, definitely look up the uh, the Fox Valley Woodworkers. They have a, uh, a group meeting every, it's the first Tuesday of every month, is that right? Yeah. Um, so join in on the group and there is a, a huge catalog of online stuff that you can, uh, you can see when you become a member there. Um, and I have actually looked at it except for your meetings are on Tuesday when I do live, so... <laughs> Maybe I'll have to change that. Um, so um, tonight this is not going to be a live for the regular. You can talk to Sarah down in the, the window down there and on the chat, um, but I'll be taking I'll be taking questions from the group. So, uh, sorry, did I change it on you? <laughs> so, um, back to the, the group. Um, tonight, I want to kind of go through all the planes, um, and I'm assuming you all know a, the standard bench plane. Um, the bench plane is... Well, basically every plane is just a jig to hold a, a chisel. Um, and most bench planes have a bevel down, uh, which is a little counterintuitive for most people coming into it. It just seems buried. But this is the plane you generally come across. This is a Stanley Bailey pattern. And that is the, the, the pattern that a lot of metal hand planes are, are um, taken off of. Um, Usually when people first get into woodworking, the big question they have is, should I get a bevel up or a bevel down? Um, a bevel up is also known as a low angle plane, most commonly a low angle jack plane. Um, and generally for a beginner, this is much, much easier. There's less bells and whistles, there's less things to adjust on it. It's just a fairly simple plane. Um, all you have is a, an adjuster back here that controls your depth and your lateral adjustment, so twisting it side to side. And that's about it. You have a cap that goes on that holds it down, and that's all there is to it. Whereas with this, you've got a lateral adjuster, you've got your depth knob, you've got the cap on here, but you also have a chip breaker. It's harder to adjust the mouth because in order to adjust the mouth, you have to move the whole frog back and forth. Whereas with this, you can just move the front of the mouth forward. So when you're first getting into it, this is an incredibly easy plane to learn. And so I tell most people, if you've got to choose one or the other and you're just getting started, a low angle is a great thing to have. There are a few things with a low angle that are much harder, and that's where the standard traditional plane comes in because this was designed for someone who had woodworking skill. Um, and so it, there's a lot of toss back and forth. Is one better than the other? No. Uh, they each have their pros and cons and different things. This is far, far superior for ingrain. Um, it's much easier to push. This is harder to push, but uh, it's, it has a little bit more function because you have a chip breaker, you have the, uh, uh, the higher angle on it. It just allows you to do a finer cut on difficult grain. But if you're doing general straight grain work, this will do you uh, phenomenally. Um, so I know that usually starts a bunch of arguments, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Anytime you start talking about hand tools, there's arguments coming along. So. The variation on everything else is basically a morphing of the standard plane. And so here I have the, the Stanley 10, or the 10 and a half. Um, and for all intents and purposes, it looks just like a Bailey pattern plane. It's basically the exact same thing, except for it's got this hole on the side that allows the iron to stick out. And let me move this in a little closer here. There we go. And when an iron comes all the way to the outside of a plane, it's a rabbited iron or a rabbiting plane. And this one will allow me to get right up into a corner so I can cut a 90 degree groove. Whereas with a standard plane, the iron doesn't come all the way outside. So there's always a little bit that the iron can't get. That tiny little wall over there stops it from getting all the way to, to, a, uh, an, all the, way to the wall. Um, so you're gonna have a lot of other planes where the iron comes all the way to the side. 
and that makes it a rabbiting plane. Except for in some cases, it's a shoulder plane. And in that case, you start to get into semantics. And that's the other problem with all hand tools, is that over the years you have literally hundreds of different traditions. And so a lot of people will say, well, traditionally this was called that. Well, I have to ask which tradition? Um, <laughs> because wherever you go and whatever time period you're in, every one of these is going to be called something different. And it's going to go by slightly different, uh, different terminologies. So a lot of times I will say this is schmo and you say this is schmo Joe. Um, it's all semantics. So if I start using a term that you're not familiar with, I'm sorry, I'm probably copying from a different tradition. Uh, <laughs> but let's, let's go back into that. Uh, so we have the rabbited plane or rabbiting plane and then you have a shoulder plane. Well, a shoulder plane is generally a lower angle cutter. You can see how this is a much, much lower angle than this. This is 45 degrees um, and the bed angle on this is at 12 degrees. So this is basically the difference between the regular bench plane and a low angle plane. So if you bring over the same ideas from this, this is great with, uh, with wild grain and hard to plane surfaces, and this is great with end grain. It's the exact same thing here. A shoulder plane is fantastic with end grain, and that's because it's designed to do the shoulders of a tenon, and the shoulders of a tenon are end grain. So you need something that's a lower angle that can do the shoulders, but you need it rabbited so it can get all the way up to the cheek of a tenon, um, and thus, the shoulder plane. Um, so let's jump in back into this and I'm going to kind of bounce around here because there's a lot of different aspects for different things. Most people know of the block plane and if you generally are power tools this is probably the first plane you get. Uh, it is a fantastic plane for doing little details. Where'd my block go? Uh, for doing chamfers. Uh, if you ever chamfered with a router try a block plane. Just a couple passes. One pass, you knock the corner off. Two passes, you get this ever so slight visible chamfer. Three passes, and you have this beautiful edge chamfer. And you can take it down to that and just count by how many passes it takes. And you do it all the way around the board, and you get the exact same chamfer on every side. And rather than getting dust everywhere and having to get the, uh, the, the router clean up, you're left with all these tiny little curls that are fantastic to play with. Um, but a block plane, most of the time, is closely related to the low angle plane. And it is a lower bed. It has a bevel up. So these two are the ones that are most common to have the bevel up. Almost every other plane is designed to have the bevel down. That can be very confusing for uh, people first getting into it. Um, and so you generally think that this is designed to do ingrain. And it can do that, but it is more or less designed to do all grains, except for difficult, squirrely grains. The reason it's beveled, uh, bevel up is that it makes it easier to push. And the reason it needs to be easier to push is it's designed to be a one-handed plane. Now, a lot of times I will have a second hand up here to guide it, but almost all the force is just coming out of the one hand in a small um, hold. And so having it a bevel up, low angle plane, means that it takes less force to cut through it. It makes it a little bit easier. Was that a question I heard? Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, block planes are, are one of those planes, if you do a lot of power tool work, putting one of these into your arsenal would allow you to do all those little detail things of breaking the edge off of a corner, adding a little chamfer, or you have a slightly rounded edge. This does a lot of little detail things that you would have to pull out a whole router set up a jig and get all of the, the dust collection and things like that in place. And this is just a block plane that's sitting up there. You grab it two or three passes and it's done. It is a great time saver for that. Um, but for someone who is generally all hand tools, the only thing I do with this is occasionally doing a, uh, a chamfer on a corner. It's not a very commonly used plane for the hand tool user. Um, and that's kind of one of those odd things is when most people think about planes, um, one of the first things that people grab is a block plane. Um, but I find I don't use it quite as much. Let me just silence that. If I'm talking too fast or mumbling, just let me know. <laughs> I 
I tend, I. Um, well, pretty much all of these planes are going to be sharpened the exact same way with a few with a few clarifications like the the cambered iron on the scrub plane, um, or a plane that's too small, such as a, uh, um, a spoke shave. Um, and oh, here, let me pop one out. Yeah, let's do this one. Be the easiest one to get to right now. <sighs> let me go ahead and grab that for you. Now that's actually one of the things that killed hand tools is, is not the loss of efficiency, but it was the loss of sharpening. Because the first skill in working with any hand tool is sharpening. And every hand tool has to be sharpened. It's one of those things that you can work with power tools with a dull tool. It will still generally do the work. It may burn it, it may give you a rough edge, but it will do the work until it gets really, really dull. With a hand tool, you're the horsepower behind it. And that means it's gotta be sharp, otherwise it just doesn't do the work. You don't have the force to push it through the wood. And so you've got to sharpen them quite a bit. Um, grab my, see? I use diamond plates. Um, the reason I like diamond plates is they are, they're very fast, they cut much faster than most stones. Um, there's no mess to them. So you're not getting that slurry that gets on all the way. You don't have to worry about flattening them. They're always flat. Uh, they're just, they're most more efficient. The problem with them, well, there's two big problems, is number one, they cut differently. So you can never get a polish off of these like you can a really high grit whetstone um, because these are actually have aggregate that will cut the steel as it goes by. With a whetstone, it's not the aggregate that cuts the steel. It's actually the slurry on top, and so that slurry is moving around, and it's sort of like an orbital sander on the surface rather than inline scratches. And those inline scratches are very obvious. They become hard to see. Um, and that's usually why people like wet stones, is they tend to give you a, uh, a more mirrored finish, which isn't necessary, but it feels great. So let me show you Oop, this way. Um, what I have is Windex. I have a coarse, a medium, and a fine. This is like 600 grit-ish. This is around 800 grit-ish. This is around 1200 grit. But the grit doesn't exactly translate to whetstones. They're a very different grit because they cut differently. Um, and I'm going to hold the blade in my hand like this. What's that? Oh, I'm on that one. Sorry. I'm going to hold the blade, fingers underneath, one finger, pointer finger in this corner, and one finger, pointer finger in this corner. If the blade is wider, I'll bring up a second one, putting even pressure across there. I'll set it on here, lift it until I feel the bevel, the angle I want. And then I'll feel if I've got the burr. Got the burr right here, but not over here. Need a little bit more on that. I'll grab my towel. Sometimes it's really hard to see on camera but you can see the scratch pattern and you can see where it's hitting all the way to the edge and it's not hitting all the way to the edge there. So I'm take it back over. This one actually needs a bit of work. And I don't use any jigs because they take more time to set up. There, now I've got a burr running all the way across. I can just feel it on the back as I slide my hand across. Go on to my coarse, and my medium. Onto the fine. Just like that. I'm gonna put it on the back and just do one pass to pull the burr up the other direction. And then onto the strop. Just a few passes on that, flip it over. And this will work the burr back and forth a little bit until it just falls off. Let's see. Yeah, you're probably not going to be able to see that one. It's pretty fine. But there's just a little wire edge right there. It's just barely hanging on. One or two more passes and it will just fall off. And there we go sharpened edge. 
Um, I generally prefer to freehand sharpen because I don't have to set up a jig. Um, the problem with freehand sharpening is it takes a long time to learn. It's not something I can show you and you do. Even if you're here with me, I can show you and, and, and correct your hands and your stance. It's one of those things that you just have to learn by doing it over and over and over again. And most people, it takes a year or so of practicing freehand sharpening until it just one day clicks. Um, and so if you're not doing it that much, you can use jigs like this one is my favorite. It's the Veritas Mark II. And this one is a great setup with this very wide wheel. So you can set it on here with the iron sticking out. Am I able to do this one right now? Yeah, I can. And so you can set it on there and uh, it runs back and forth, runs very, very smoothly. Um, but with that, yeah, that's sharp. Actually, since I have it on camera, might as well do this. There, now I got a bald spot. I know, people like seeing that for some reason. This is called hand tool pattern baldness. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the way I'm going to do pretty much all of these unless they have a cambered iron or something interesting. They're, they're all run basically just like that. And we can adjust this one. Come on, move over. Oop, too far. Nope, need to hit the one back in. This one, um, some planes will have a lateral adjuster on them, block planes. This one does not. So this one is a lot more finicky. Um, traditionally, well, traditionally in most traditions, um, planes were wooden and you actually adjusted them with a mallet, which sounds like it's a lot more work. Um, but it's one of those things where once you have the skill, it actually doesn't take that much more time. It just takes more skill. And that's one of the things with a lot of hand tools is that it's not about um, ease or one is harder than the other. It's more about it takes skill. And unfortunately, the only way you can get skill is to do it over and over and over and over again and mess up over and over and over and over again and bang your head against the wall um, until one day it finally clicks. Um, and that's just the way skills come. Whereas the nice thing with most power tools is the skill isn't as much in running the tool. The skill is in setting up the jig and making sure everything is in alignment and getting all of that dialed in. And so it's a, it's a different type of skill. Uh, once a table saw is set up, any monkey can run boards through it and, and get really nice things. The skill is in the setup as opposed to in the function. Whereas in a hand plane, you have the skill required to set up the hand plane. You also have the skill in its function. Um, so it's one of those things you have to learn both sides. So um, any questions there? Otherwise, I'll jump back into the next thing on the list. Um, I believe. Hmm? Oh, you're yeah, sorry, them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm listening to them here. And so this this is a rabbit plane. So we have we've talked about a rabbiting plane. A rabbiting plane is anything where the blade comes all the way outside. It's a rabbiting plane. But then there is a rabbit plane, and a rabbit plane is designed for making rabbits. Um, unless you are from the UK, then they are called rebates. Um, yeah, more terminology fun. Um, but a rabbiting, uh, rabbit plane is, uh, it has the blade, oops, sorry. Let me re let's calibrate this. Let's move down here. It has the blade that comes all the way to the outside. Um, so it is a rabbiting plane. But this one also has a depth stop. So I can only plane down until it hits this depth stop. It also has a fence, so I can only plane in to the fence. And so this will then give me the dimension of my rabbit. My rabbit is this deep by this wide, or this, this deep by this wide. And so it becomes very easy, then I can adjust my fence, and I can make a really wide rabbit, or I can make a really narrow rabbit, and adjust these to exactly where I want, and get it to go. Um, also, this one has a spur up here, or a knicker. Um, there we go. 
And right now it's retracted, but I can actually loosen that screw, turn it 90 degrees, and it's a small blade that sticks out. Let me grab that and show you. Do, 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 do. This one, nope. We're playing guess the screwdriver. This one. Will this one get me in there? No, and my good one's over there. So I guess we're not gonna do that one right now. I'll show you on a, on a later one. Um, but what this will do is it gives me a small blade that sticks down and that blade is perfectly flush with the outside of the plane. And what that will do is allow me to go across the grain. So whoop, most of the time, if I run a rabbit with the grain and I run along the board, back out a little bit, it's no problem at all on the edge. Eh, let me see if I can put it in here and run a couple. So in this case, I can set it on here, move the fence in so I'm not taking all the board off. And as I run it along, it's no problem at all because the very edge of the blade is going to give me a very nice knife wall along here because I'm going with the grain, it can peel up. But if I want to go across the grain, the problem is all of those fibers that I'm slicing, if I'm slicing them this way, the fibers are just going to pop up and become um, a ragged edge. So this is like having a knife on there that will cut those fibers just in front of where the iron comes in. And that will allow me to get a really clean cut across the board, um, having that little spur down in front. And that is fantastic for when you want to um, do all the way around the board. So if you're doing a, uh, a groove in a panel, oops, wrong button, still, no, four. There we go, wrong button. Um, so if you have a, uh, uh, like a, a panel that's going into a groove all the way around a, a door, a raised panel door, um, if you want to have that rabbit running all the way around the board, you can use that to go across the ends of the panel so that you get a really nice clean cut and you don't have all the ragged things sticking up. Now, this, you will also hear it called a moving philister plane. And that's because it has a philister that moves, which is just another term from England or another country. Uh, <laughs> so they, they go all over the place. But this is the exact same plane as this. And most of the time you're going to hear the metal ones called a rabbiting plane or a rabbit plane. And you'll hear the wooden ones called a moving philister plane, even though they do the exact same thing. And so in this case we have um, all the brass, and this looks really, really cool. Uh, this one actually has a piece of very, very hard wood. If you look in there in the end, this cutout here on the end is actually a piece of box wood. And so putting that in is called boxing. Uh, so on a wooden plane, this gives you a very, very durable edge. This would wear away very easily if it was the same wood as the rest. But because it's made of boxing or box wood, it becomes a very durable edge that'll last a lot longer. So in this case, we have the plain iron that comes all the way to the outside, so it's rabbit plain. We also have another iron right here, and this iron runs all the way down, and it's a spur that sticks out in front. We have our depth stop, and then we have a fence, so we can loosen these up and move in and out. So it'll do the exact same things as this, but just in a wooden format. And this one's kind of cool because you can you loosen this screw, and then you can actually run this in and out. So. And that will allow you to adjust this up and down very accurately. Kind of cool how they, uh, how they uh, used to put things together. Um, yeah, just ingenious. Now this, this may look very, very familiar to the next plane. This is a molding plane. And molding planes are a lot of fun. The only downside to a molding plane is it's designed to do one job and one job only. So this particular one, this is a beading plane. It runs a bead on here and so you can see the converse shape of what would be cut into it. And so it has a specified iron. Let me knock this out. Come around the edge here. I normally would grab my uh, iron plane. Plain iron, plain mallet. Plain mallet, there's the term. You can see how the iron is shaped like the molding 
on the front of this. And so these are very difficult to sharpen. You can't just put them down on a plate and sharpen them. Uh, this one I'll actually wrap sandpaper around a dowel and file it over that. And if I end up doing them quite a bit, I'll actually use the plane and I will um, make a profile that is exactly matching to this that I can then sharpen this on that profile. Uh, but I don't use molding planes very often, and so making a matching profile to sharpen it is often a uh, more time consuming than it's worth. So these go back into there. And the nice thing about these is they're really, really simple. Slide the iron in, slide the wedge in, and that's all it is. Iron, body, and wedge. Let me grab my plane mallet. Oh no, my plane mallet's missing. Oh, there it is. A plane mallet. Move that. Can back this up. Set that, that in there. And I want to make sure that the iron isn't sticking out. With this, we can just tap it down a little farther. Light taps. I'm just going to feel it with my finger underneath until it's just sticking out the right amount. That's close to it. Set the head again. And then we can take it back to the board and see how we're doing on that. Oh, need a little more. And all wooden, there we go. All wooden planes are adjusted the same way. Oh my. Okay, yeah, I haven't used this one in a while. <laughs> this one needs some work. Uh, if you look down here, I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, this is actually bent. Uh, the body here is curved. Um, and this is one I've never used before, so I thought I'd take it out today, but apparently I didn't check it beforehand, so there's no way this one would work. Um, that's one of the problems with a lot of wood, old wooden planes is they tend to warp over time. Yeah, wow. Um, and this one needs a lot more work. And once they warp like that, you can try and reprofile them, but most of the time this one's warped a little bit past what I can reprofile. It's pretty much trash. But it will look really good on the shelf. And so if you look up here, I have all of these molding planes, of which I've probably only used two or three. Um, and that's just because I don't do a lot of molding. And if I did, there would be like three or four moldings that I would use all the time, like the OG on your router bit. It's just the one that always gets used. Um, so let's move on to the modern equivalent to a molding plane, the next step. This is a combination plane. Now this is the Stanley 55. This is the, um, what's often referred to as the king of hand planes. It is, it's 55 molding planes in one. This will do rabbits, this will do grooves, this will do tongues, this will do moldings, um, this will do all of it. It has the younger brother, the 45, which will do 95 to 99% of what the 55 will do, except for the 45 is much, much cheaper. Uh, but the 55 has a few other bells and whistles that make it a little bit different. Uh, so in this, you have, a pile of, yeah, yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> this, this will, uh, you have fences that come off of here, and then you've got two body pieces that come apart on this, and they all slide on these rails. And so you've got these two skates that will support the iron. So in this case, I have a quarter inch cutter in here, so it's just set up to do plow work, and this will support either edge of that cutter. Or if I have one, let me pull these out, what we have here is all of the cutters that it can do. And so whoop, that one plane can do all of these profiles. And this is less than a quarter of all the profiles that can be done. Um, actually, this is less than an eighth of all the profiles that it can do. And so we have things like double and triple beading. I have one that's a quadruple beading. We have a tongue plane, so you can do tongues. We have window moldings. Um, you have OGs of all different shape and size, Roman OGs. Um, you could do hollows and rounds. And just different setups for different cutters. And each one of them has a different orientation for how the blades need to go. And then you have different setups for the fences. And then with the 55, the special thing is this second skate can actually go up and down. So it isn't locked at the same height as the first skate. This one can actually go lower and higher so you can adjust and support the iron in a different place. Uh, so this is like the most 
notorious of all crazy planes. And a lot of hand tool woodworkers really do not like the 45 and 55 because it kind of smacks of power tool because most of the skill in a 55 is the setup. Uh, once it's set up, it really doesn't take that much to run, but they can take a lot of time to set up because there's just so many different ways. That's why most of them end up with a quarter inch cutter to do grooves. Um, <laughs> which, you know, you got this fancy 55 that may have cost you five, six hundred dollars um, that you do grooves with. <laughs> but that's the way of things. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of run through these. So if there's something you want me to jump back to, we can do that when I, when I get through this. Uh, let's see, what other things do I have on here? We talked that. Uh, okay, um, so then we have the spoke shave. Uh, the spoke shave is a phenomenal plane when you're trying to do all sorts of different edges, all sorts of different uh, um, functions. This, you can do a lot of chamfering work with it. You can do rounded edges and curves. Um, the nice thing about the way this works is you don't grab a spoke shave out here. You'll notice it has these flat spots back here. You pinch it, thumb and forefinger right here, and you run it just like that. So these handles back here are more or less for reference that you don't need them to hold onto it. And so you want to be very delicate with how you hold it. And with that, you can then run along the board. And spoke shaves come in many different types. Uh, most common is a flat bottom Stanley 51 like this. With this, you can do pretty much anything. Uh, excuse me, this is a 151. Um, and this will allow you to do most any shape. And even though it's a flat bottom, you can do gently rounded curves by just extending the, iron, <coughs> extending the iron out a little farther. You can also get rounded bottoms, but rounded bottoms, let me grab one, rounded bottoms are a little more difficult because you have to have it at the right angle. So if I roll it forward a little too far, it doesn't cut at all. If I roll it back a little far, it doesn't cut at all. You have to get it at that very precise angle for it to cut. And that takes a lot of practice to be able to hold. And a lot of people end up doing that with it because maintaining that roll as you push it forward is actually uh, more difficult than it, than it seems. Um, what's going on? Oh, they're singing. <laughs> I'm hearing wailing coming from the other room. It's just the kids. Uh, this, this is a cabinet scraper. This is one of my favorites. Um, if you hate sanding flat surfaces, this will, this will revolutionize your world. Um, this is just, mm, yes, phenomenal. Um, a cabinet scraper is basically a card scraper. Um, a card scraper is great, but it's, it's often difficult because you're forcing it to bend and it heats up in your hand uh, and it's just annoying for doing large surfaces. If you're doing small detail cleanup, a card scraper is great. But a cabinet scraper is a card scraper held in a jig and so you don't actually have to do anything with it. Now, this may seem like it should go that way because the plane is angled back, but it actually goes this way. It's just like a card scraper in that you lean it forward and you plane your surface. And so in this case, with this one, you slide it in. Let me actually back it up. Oh, this one's been locked in, isn't it? So you slide it in until the card touches the table. You lock these down. And then you have the screw on the back, which will bend that card forward just a little bit. And that puts a little bit of pressure on it and allows that bend to then push down into the work. And so with this, I can now clean up the top of my bench. And I'll get these beautiful, wispy, fine little curls that are just gorgeous. But the nice thing about this is it doesn't care if you go with the grain, it doesn't care if you go across the grain, it doesn't care if you are working on wild and crazy grain. Um, in some of the, the most horrible woods, like, uh, um, a loose curly white oak. Um, you look at that fine, you're gonna get tear out. It is just, it's a pain. This has no problem with it all. It looks at it and just says, okay, I'll do it. Um, and so it has all the benefits of sanding, but without the dust, you get curls instead. And this is far more enjoyable than sitting there for hours with an orbital. Um, and it gives you this beautiful surface. Um, now that can get us into the difference between sanding and planing. 
And that's, um, yeah, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, just like a card scraper, uh, with a, what you have is, um, it's a square shape. So you have a perfectly flat top, perfectly flat sides. And so it comes to a 90 degree edge here and a 90 degree edge here. And that's where you start with. Um, then you grab a burnisher. Where is my burnisher? There it is. And a burnisher is a piece of steel that is very, very hard. Um, I actually use um, carbide rods. You can get it with just hardened steel, but you need steel that is harder than your card. And in this case, this one's actually I'm grab one that's a little easier. Grab these ones. Um, this one I haven't squared it off right now, so I won't get what I'm looking for, but I'll show you how to. I'm going to hold it at 90 degrees. I put the corner into it, pushing away from me, and I'm just going to run down like this. And what this is doing is it's pushing that top edge down. And it's actually creating a bit of a mushroom. That top edge is spreading out and squishing out to the side. So I'm getting a burr to stick off this way and a burr to stick off this way. <clears throat> so just 90 degrees like this. And yeah, uh, the, window, the next thing I'm going to do is then I'm going to grab it, pull it up here, and I'm going to pull it across while I go down. And so that's going to pull this burr out this way. And I'm going to lean it at like a five degree angle. So I'll start here. And just like that, that's going to force this burr to stick out even farther and hook down a little bit. And I'll turn it around and I'll do the same thing on this side. Just a slight angle down, pulling it across the blade while pushing down. And that's going to give me a burr over here. It's a hook on both sides. And so if you imagine that hook sticking down, that hook is actually carving out the wood as it goes through. And the nice thing with the card scraper is if this hook dies and runs away, then I can turn this around and I've got another fresh hook on this side. And lo and behold, I've got another edge over here, another edge over here. And if I really want to, I can do this end and this end. Um, and so there's a lot of edges you can do with this. It's going to be the exact same thing on here. Um, though a lot of these like to sharpen them at 45, they'll still turn a burr on it. The nice thing about sharpening at 45 is that it's easier to turn the burr on that than it is to do it at a, a solid 90 on the end. Uh, does that make sense? I'm going to run through it too fast. Yeah, it's, it's done the exact same way, except for you're just working on one edge. So if this had, so if I have the 45 degree angle there, all I'm doing is turning that burr back this way. Um, so I'm just getting the one edge. And the reason for that is the 45 degree is easier to turn the burr on it. Um, and I'm not going to be spending the time to turn this around back and forth. If I run out of that, it's actually faster just to sharpen it and put it back in uh, when I take it out. And so that's why that's on there. But if, if you're talking about card scrapers, it's one of those things that there are, if you talk to 10 different people how to sharpen a card scraper, you're going to get 13 different ideas. Um, there are so many different methods for sharpening card scrapers. And if you're having problems with it, then try a different method. And then you're going to have problems with that one and try a different method. And eventually you'll find one method that's like, oh yeah, this suddenly works. This is the best method. Um, but for other people, that's one that they jump over because it doesn't work for them. And it's one of those things where, yeah, there's a thousand ways to do it, but only one of those thousand works for you. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that. Oh, and yes. Um, the router plane. Now this is probably the most useful tool to the average power tool woodworker. And the reason is this allows you to get into perfectly tight corners. Uh, it allows you to flatten out things exactly and precisely at a lower plane than your main surface. Um, when, the, when you're working with, with hand tools versus power tools, Power tools cannot make a perfectly clean three-dimensional corner. So if you have three-dimensional corner, you can get close to it with a vibra saw or you can use a, a, a square um, hollow auger, um, but you're never going to get a clean surface on one of those three. Whereas with hand tools, you can get a perfectly sharp corner um, that is clean on all three surfaces. And that's where a router really comes in, is if you're doing a groove or a dado or um, um, uh, tenons and they're sticking out, this will allow you 
to then stick down a little farther. So here I have a router blade. Um, yeah, it gets a little confusing because this is a, a hand router. The blade sticks down lower than the plate. And so this plate will be riding on the main surface with this blade lowering farther down. And I can easily adjust it to whatever depth I want down. And this will then give me a beautifully clean cut at an exact distance down from the main surface. So if I'm cleaning out the bottom of a groove, um, like a lot of times you'll cut out a groove or a dado um, with a table saw and you're left with all those ridges from the table saw. You bring this back in there and it will clean the bottom out just phenomenally. You'll get this glass smooth surface on there um, you know, as long as it's set up right. And so with a router plane, it is, yeah, it's one of those tools that just, it's phenomenal. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the price on these has just gone through the roof in the last couple of years. Um, when I first got into it, you could pick one up with a single cutter for 20 bucks. And now you can't sneeze at one with a single cutter unless it's like 80 to $90. Um, and they're, they're almost the price, the antiques being the same price as a brand new one from Veritas. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, cool. Um, I got through those. So what, what questions do we have? What, is there anything particular you wanted to, me to talk on? Didn't I? Oh, I did have it. I had one more plane to talk about. <laughs> What's that? Oh, sorry, babe. <laughs> My wife is listening to the YouTube chat, and so I'm talking to uh, you guys. And that's him. Um, so a scrub plane. Um, this is the the Stanley Number no. Forty, um, and it is a a thin plane, not terribly long, but it has a very cambered iron on there. And so if you look at it from the end. It's got this big mouth and it sticks up um, almost an eighth inch more than the body of the plane. And what this will do is it'll take off a lot of material very, very quickly. Um, if, if I'm spot cleaning things up or if I'm trying to flatten a slab, this will allow me to take off a lot of material because it's cambered. It doesn't take off anything at the edges, but in the middle it takes off almost an eighth inch. Um, and so, this leaves you a very undulated surface, um, but it takes off a lot of material very, very quickly. So I'll use this to hit the surface and get it close to flat. Um, and then I'm gonna come in with a fairly heavy set um, bench plane. So this is taking off a fairly heavy shaving, you know, three or four hundredths of an inch, which is a pretty heavy shaving for a hand plane. Um, and that will then clean up the surface and get rid of the ridges that this have come in. And then I will grab a jointer plane, one of these, and this will allow me to then flatten and smooth out everything. And then I'll come in with my smoothing plane, and the smoothing plane will then get rid of any of the tear out left from this, and will allow me to spot clean and get that glass smooth surface. So this is only taking off a thousandth, maybe two thousandths of an inch in every pass. Um, and so there's a whole series, but the first one to touch is usually the scrub plane. Um, or some places you'll hear it called a four plane. Um, but usually a four plane is referring to a longer scrub plane. It still has that large cambered iron, but it tends to be a little wider. Um, it's called a four plane because it comes before all of the other planes. It's the first one to touch the, the wood. Um, did that answer your question with the scrub plane? <laughs> no. Well, the, the zero is so small you can't see it. Um, the, the number one, and for those of you who don't know, the number one is considered the most collectible hand plane. Um, a number one in good shape, an average number one, is usually around $1,000 to $2,000. But unfortunately, it's so small that it's pretty much worthless. Um, it has no real function in the shop, but it's a collector's piece, and everyone's got to have a number one. Um, but the number zero is... Um, you have to find it with a microscope, and so those are those are crazy expensive. <laughs> well, yeah. So the the question is, what about a six or a seven? Um, so I have a seven here, 
and I've got the big beefy number eight, which is two inches longer and a little bit wider. Um, the, the thing is, when you're looking at a plane and its length, the longer the plane is, the more the plane will guarantee flatness. Because if I'm sitting on a board that's undulating, and the front here is sitting on a hill, and the back here is sitting on a hill, and the mouth is sitting on a valley, it's not going to cut anything. But I go forward a little ways until the mouth is on that hill, and now it will cut the top off that hill. And so because of that, this will only hit the high spots, it will not hit the low spots. And so this will allow me to flatten very easily, and it will tell me when it's flat because itself is a large flat surface. Whereas with a smaller plane, it can ride up and down the hill, and this can still take out um, material out of the valley. So this isn't very good for flattening surfaces. But a lot of times you'll have a spot where you have a little bit of tear out, and you just want to hit that one spot rather than hitting the whole surface. This will allow you to just hit that one spot and clean it up rather than detailing it. And so that's why when you go through the series, you're usually um, getting rid of a lot of material with a scrub plane. And then you'll get rid of the marks with the scrub plane with a, a five or something like that. Then you'll come in with your big plane, and this will allow you to actually flatten everything out perfectly and get a really nice flat and even plane. And then you'll come in with your small smoothing plane, and this will allow you to do the little detailed spot cleanups because it can dive into the surfaces and take a little bit more out here and a little bit more out there. So the length of the plane is just how flat are you wanting to do it. You can do it all with a number four, a smaller plane, but if you're gonna be flattening with a, with a small plane, you're gonna need something like a straight edge. A straight edge disappeared. Um, so the straight edge will tell you when it's flat. So, yeah. Um, if the question is, would you use a smoother or a scraper? Um, they, have different, they have different purposes. Um, a smoother, if you set it up perfectly, and that meaning the mouth is tight, the iron is incredibly sharp, the chip breaker is close to the edge, you're taking off a very, very light cut, and it's set up absolutely perfectly. You can get a glass smooth surface on the most incredibly difficult woods. Um, that, that curly white oak we were talking about. This can do that. The problem is, you take about 60 shavings, and it's dull to the point it's gonna start causing problems. With a card scraper, when the card scraper gets dull, it's not gonna start causing problems, it's just not gonna be cutting anymore. Um, and so the card scraper is a little bit more forgiving. There isn't a whole lot of setup that goes into it. And so the card scraper is really easy for that, that difficult grain. Um, so most of the time, um, this will be the last thing that touches the wood. So I, I'll do all that, that surface prep, and then I'll take my smoothing plane onto it, and it's ready for finish. But if I'm working with really difficult wood, then I may then go to the card scraper and clean up here and there and, and finish up with that. But technically, they should leave about the same finish. Though if you're going with just a card scraper, it might feel a little fuzzy, um, as opposed to having a plain sole that will burnish the wood a little bit. Hope that answered the question. Well, no, no, like a, a card scraper or a scraper plane, they're basically the same thing. Um, it's just this is easier, the, car, the scraping plane is just a little bit easier to work with. Um, you're, not having to f you're not having to flex it with your hand. But as to the actual finishing, they both can do it. The scraper plane is just easier to work with. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, this is basically a router plane. So it's basically this, but with a very wide iron. Um, and so that iron would stick down the eighth inch or so to hollow out the space for the hinge to go into. But yeah. There are a ton of different names for this. And um, <laughs> yeah, uh, a hinge mortise plane, um, a hinge router plane, um, a lock plane, a lock mortise plane, uh, yeah. St I think the, the Stanley, 
yeah, for, um, for any mortise that's shallow and wide, this works out great. What else we got? Planes face down? Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually a really interesting discussion because um, if you look at most, most all of the historical and um, from pretty much every culture across time, planes were put face down. Um, however, the problem with that, um, well, there's a couple different things. The idea is that if you put it face down, you're going to be resting it on the very tip of the iron. And so theoretically, that will ruin the tip of the iron. Um, and so a lot of shop teachers started telling students, no, lay it on its side because I'm the one who's going to have to sharpen that iron and I don't want you messing it up. And then the next generation said, oh, planes are supposed to be left on their side. And if you went to shop anywhere from 1930 on up into the 60s and 70s, you were taught you put the plane on its side, you do not put it on its face. Um, but there's a couple of problems with that. If you put it on its side, now the blade is open to other things moving around on the bench. You might hit it with another plane and put a nick in it. Or worse yet, your hand might be what goes by it. Um, and so in general, most of the time I put it by face down. Um, but that then drives a lot of people who are taught in shop absolutely crazy, so I'm sorry. <laughs> now, I actually, um, I was raised all power tools. Um, I, I had a full shop with every, uh, yeah, it was a really, really nice shop. Um, but over time, ended up selling this and selling that and selling that until one day I became an all-hand tool woodworker. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the question about the steel that's used for the iron. So, uh, there's a lot of debates in that, um, and there are so many different schools of thoughts. Most common are A2 and O1, um, and those are the ones that most planes are going to be made out of. And each one of them has its pros and cons, and one's a little bit more durable than the other, but the one that's more durable requires a little bit more sharpening time. And so the question is, do you want to sharpen it more often and it's easier? Um, or do you want to sharpen it less often, uh, but it's more difficult to sharpen when you have to? Um, and in all honesty, if I were to give you a plane with each of those, you wouldn't be able to tell which was which. Um, unless you've spent years of working with them, you're, you're never going to be able to tell the difference between them. Um, you start getting into some of the more technical steels like PMV 11, and there's a lot of other new ones that are coming in. And you, you get different aspects here and there, but most of them are, for the average person, you're, you're not going to feel a difference. Um, and if you really want to see that, I did a, a, a whole series recently where I put, um, what was it, 30, 24 different irons, it was a lot, uh, plain irons, and I ran them all through a series of durability and testing um, multiple times each iron. Um, and it was very interesting to see that if you zoom in and you look at the chart closely, there's a wide range in steel quality. But if you zoom out and look at it in its totality, all of them are in a fairly neat, tight band. There really isn't a huge quality of difference between them. Um, but that being said, everyone can get uh, very, there are a lot of camps and a lot of arguments start over steel quality and types. <laughs> Did you have a particular question about it or? Yeah, in my test, the best of the best was the PMV11 from Veritas. 
but best of the best, it was slightly better than the Lee Nielsen, uh, which was slightly better than the Wood River. Um, and so it, it just, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, the, the one thing I, I did learn in the test is that far more important than the steel that's used is how it was hardened, how it was tempered. Um, very minute changes in the temperature at different times and how it was done, how it was quenched, can have a wild difference in the steel type. So um, it is far more important to look at the manufacturer and the, what went into it than it is to look at what type of steel it is. What's that? Uh-huh. Yeah, especially with the, the wide steel of that one, it's, uh, yeah. The carriage maker point. Oh, yes. Um, not really. Um, you have this and then you have the, the jackrabbit. The jackrabbit is basically the exact same thing, but in this size of a plane. Um, and this is great if I'm doing large tenons. And I mean like four or five inch long tenons. Um, this is, is phenomenal for that. But yeah, uh, I've only used this in actual function um, once. Um, so it, it's not really that useful. I mean, you can, you can do the exact same thing. Where did it go? Where am I 78? With a, uh, with a rabbit plane, just take everything off and it'll do the same thing. You just need to do two passes rather than one pass. Um, so yeah, don't, unless you're doing timber framing and you're doing big joinery all the time, in which case then that is incredibly useful. Um, but for most furniture working, it just doesn't have a huge place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly where in the carriage we work. That's a field I haven't looked into too much. But there's, there's a lot of um, carriage maker adaptations. Um, so there is a, there's the carriage maker's plane, then there's a carriage maker's plow plane, uh, there's a carriage maker's compass plane. Um, <laughs> and so there, there's uh, the, the car well, like carriage work and coopering work. Um, coopering is when they make uh, wooden stave barrels. There was a lot of adapting one into the other. Um, and so you have the Cooper's version of the standard plane and you have the carriage maker's version of the standard plane. <laughs> yeah, um, well, actually, I just put these on as I had. Let me see if I've got one of them down here. Ah, there we go. Um, it is a profile. He was asking about how I hold the planes into the rack and back. And so those blue bits are basically this. I just 3D printed new ones because I wanted to make this measurement um, changeable. And what, so what happens is the top of the plane houses it underneath this and so it stops the plane from tipping backwards and then the bottom of the plane then sits on top of this little angled ledge and so gravity is wanting to tip the plane back it's not wanting to pull it down and so that lip on the top whoop, let's see if I can get this up that lip on the top is stopping the plane from rotating back and so all you have to do to take it out then is lift it up a little bit until the heel comes off the rest and pick it out and drop it down. And so then to put them back, it's as simple as lock the toe into it, put the bottom down in, set it down and let it go. And they're just like that. And then when I take them out, and uh, quick and easy. Yeah, and if you want to, I have a whole video 
dedicated to making that. Um, so if you want to see the specifics on it. And for those of you who don't know, I, have, I now have almost 2,000 videos um, on my YouTube channel um, covering joints, joinery. I pretty much have a dedicated video to every tool I've talked about today as well as everything else on them. <laughs> would like it. This has been fun. Yeah, and if you ever have any questions, um, feel free to send me an email. I have that on my uh, um, my website has a contact page as well as um, YouTube on the About Me tab. You can see the email there, and I I answer as I, I answer all of them. <laughs> my wife will let you know I sit in bed at night answering questions. And... Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, the question is about uh, the comment was about the, the foot powered lathe. If you haven't seen that, I have uh, a series. I made the um, oh come on, Roy Underhill. Wow, name disappeared. Um, he had one making a, a foot powered lathe out of a two by twelve, uh, twelve foot long, I think it was. And so you you cut that all apart into different pieces, and you make a full lathe out of that single board, basically. And uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it is not a lathe to turn things. You, you, you do turn things on it, but the, the, the enjoyment is, is playing with it, not actually producing things off of it. Um, whatever you, whatever you want, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'll send you an email when I'm done. Yep. My pleasure. <laughs> well, if, you, if you really want, I have a video on every tool I, storage item up here, so. Cool. My pleasure. There, you should be able to hear me now. So thank you everyone for holding on. Um, this is with, was kind of one of the things they've been trying to get me to come and talk there for a while, um, but it's always been on a Tuesday. So <laughs> we thought we would work with this. So what questions we got? Well, first of all, you need to thank Tom and Wasn't Trent for their super chat. Woo! Did you don't have little woo, woo, woo. No, I unplugged that. <laughs> Did they have any particular questions to answer? Oh, I got, I got the look. I got the look. Wouldn't be alive without the 
know, has asked way back at the beginning, what are your thoughts on a rabbiting block party? Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> you know, in all honesty, uh, rabbiting black block plane is a great thing to have because it can do all of the things. But are they not getting my sound? Oh no! I told you to turn them on. So your mic hasn't been on. Oh, I'm sorry. You also have to you have to rotate your dial too. I did that. Okay. Um, yeah, no, a, a rabbiting block plane can you hear me um, is nice because it does all the functions, but Other, you know, tenons, it would be useful. Um, I have one up here. I, I just don't use it. Um, this is the one I use, and I, I, I don't think about it when I do tenons. Um, so I, it, it, it would be a personal thing whether or not you would use it that often. Personally, I don't think it's worth the extra expense to get a rabbiting block plane. But if the price is similar between the two, especially if you're getting a new one, it's often they're, they're not too far apart. It might be, but it's a personal thing. <laughs> What's next? What's next? Look, it's all bossy all of a sudden. <sighs> Take a breath. You didn't do it for the last hour. Okay. <laughs> Mobius flight. How do you square the bevel? Just picked up a real nice Stanley number six, but the iron was ground with a skew. How do you square the bevel? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so he's talking about how do you make sure the blade is 90 oh, degrees to the side? Bit. Um, and all honesty, I don't. Um, if it's off square a little bit, it doesn't really make any difference. That's why you have a lateral adjuster on a plane so that you can adjust for that. Now, I do attempt to try and move them close to square. Um, is it on your transmitter as well? I have everything on. And your dial is turned? <laughs> Where is Kamikaze Duck? <laughs> to throw them at you. Uh, I could put a fork in you. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at it. Um, when you're, when you're freehand it. sharpening it, it's well, even if you're in a jig, it's just as easy as putting pressure on the side you want to take more material off of. And five or six sharpenings later, now it's out of square the other way. Um, and then you put more pressure on the other side. Um, so it's one of those things I don't try to square them. I don't sharpen until it's square. I just... If it's out of square one way, I just work it back slowly over several sharpenings. And if it's out of square, then it really doesn't make that big a difference. And, you know, as long as it's not like crazy out of square and turning it into a skew, um, having it out of square three or four degrees one way or the other really just doesn't make that big a difference. So, well, four degrees, five degrees, it's probably starting to make a difference there. But most of the time it's only out of square one, maybe two at the most. And in that case, it doesn't matter. We must acknowledge Sir Tom's super chat. Sir Tom. That's all he gets. Come on. <laughs> all right. Ready? What is his full moniker, Sir Tom? The, I can't remember what it is. We need to make plaques one of these days. <laughs> we will bestow them with great <laughs> honor at the Ren Fest one day. All right, ready? Yes. Do they allow loud laughing in Hawaii, or do they just do a low ha? <laughs> I, oh, I love you. It's okay. I did my spreadsheet joke about you when you were talking. <laughs> oh, I didn't get that many. I've already used a couple of them. I didn't use that many be, or find that many because I didn't know how much I would have to do. All right, let's see. John Juggler super chatted. Haven't been able to catch the live show in a bit. Thanks for all the information, Cadet. Keep it up. Thanks, John. Oh, I sound better now. Thank Thanks. you, man. Did you hear the song about the tortilla? What? Actually, it was more of a rap. <laughs> hey, I know. <laughs> Y'all, I'm running out of jokes. I'm going to have to start reusing them at this point. <laughs> Now, one of these We've days been doing lives do, for a very long time. We're going to do a uh, wood by right um, dead mom joke. 
the whole show is just No, 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 jokes. you gotta do like they do with like the comedians where they face each other and see who cracks first. Oh, yes, yes. That's yes. what we, we need, need to do. do. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, that's coming up one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> we both evil laugh. We'll call it the bench joke video. <laughs> Sit on either side of the bench. And... No, who cracks first? That's the real title. <laughs> 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 All right. <sighs> Back to the questions. Pain the Three Monkeys Racing asks, does the 55 have a cutter for going across the grain like the rabbit he had out? Yes. Um, the 55 also has spurs, just like that rabbit I had. So you can put those down into place um, and cut across the grain. Yeah, the 55, the 45, um, all the Stanley rabbiting planes, most... Uh, even like the, the Stanley rabbiting block plane has, well, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, but yeah, it's pretty common on rabbiting planes to have that, um, other than shoulder planes because those are tended, designed to do end grain, so they generally do not have that. Good question. All right, we got another. Um, yeah, we probably, well, we only have nine minutes left, so we'll see well, how many we can Well, Tim just super chatted a question. So okay. he says, great info as always is a scrub Ver Wait, is a scrub versus a setup number five worth it? Does that make sense? Um, a scrub plane versus a number five. So we've got the number five and the scrub plane, which disappeared. Oh, scrub plane's over here. It's hiding. Um, so I've got, no, that's not my scrub five. If, no, no. Modify a number five. It is far cheaper. It works just as good. And having both of them, I often use the number five over the scrub plane. Um, this will allow me to do a little bit deeper cut, but it isn't as wide, so it takes a few more passes. So I generally use the number five that I've modified into a four plane. So yeah, just get a cheap, junky number four, number five, modify the iron and you're good to go. But. All right, so Timothy gets a mom joke. I'm sorry if they're bad tonight, guys. These are on the fly. Those are the best. I told my suitcases just now there will be no holiday this year. I'm now dealing with emotional baggage. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear me again? <sighs> you want me to take a look? Here. Oh, oh it's on. I wonder if I'm covering it. I have done all that I can do. Transmitter receiver, then, then, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look at it. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> She's good. Problems with the technology. Ay, 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 ay. What do we got? What did Mason Kerr ask? What's the best way to sharpen the cabinet scraper? I know it's different than a card scraper. Um, it's the exact same thing, actually. Um, it's just, it's at 45 degrees. So with a, with a card scraper, you make it at 90 degrees so you can sharpen both edges. Um, but it is more difficult to turn the burr on a 90 degree edge. Whereas if I sharpen it at 45 degrees, then I only have the one edge to work on, but it's very easy to turn a burr on a 45 degree edge. Um, and so that's why cabinet scrapers, you, you don't need to flip them around. So it's just easier to do a 45 degree, quickly turn the bevel on there. Um, and so when you resharpen it, you just sharpen it at 45 degrees, turn the bevel on there and put it back in. Uh, so that's why it's at 45 degrees. It's just easier to turn the burr on that. But it's done the exact same way as a 90 degree. It's just you're just doing it on the one side. It's just you're just. Okay. <laughs> What's next? Eva Scroll asks, best final finish between a number two and a number three make any difference? Nope. Um, number two, very hard to fit most hands. Sarah would enjoy it. Um, but they'll give you the exact same finish. Number two is just is smaller, so it does less space. Um, number two, you can probably spot clean a little bit more than a number three. Um, but they'll, they'll do the exact same work. What's next? Chris Peters, what plane do you like to use on your shooting board the most? 
Um, I like to use my shooting board plane, which I didn't talk about tonight. My Stanley, number 51. Um, back this up a little bit. And I have a whole video that I did on this one recently. And this is actually designed to be on a shooting board. Uh, so this, this is the sole. The side is where the mouth is. And so you can also see it is angled. Um, it's not skewed, it's angled. So the whole frog is turned up. And so this will then fit in the slot on my shooting board and slide along there. Um, and the blade is much, much wider. So it can do a very large area. So this is my preferred plane. However, these oh, focus, focus. cost crazy, crazy, crazy amounts of money. Um, they're one of the most expensive hand planes. So in place of that, the next best thing is a low angle jack plane. Um, and this is what I used for a long, long time until I got one of those. Um, this will work phenomenally well. If you don't have enough for this, then a five or a six will do just fine. Um, low angle is just a little bit easier on end grain, but a regular plane can do. You just end up spending more time sharpening it. If you're gonna use that camera anymore, can you focus it next time? Oh, is that out of focus? Oh, yes, I was trying to get your attention, but you weren't. Just throw something at me, babe. You're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I usually just throw shade. Anyways. Um, <laughs> I got two more questions that I've pulled up, and those will be our final two. Sorry, guys. Okay. And gals. Um, Eva Scroll, what about chisel planes? I don't see too many people using them. Um, I do cabinet, and I use it all the time. <sighs> that shows you how often I use my chisel plane. <laughs> I've made four or five of them. Um, this one is actually made um, with a uh, uh, block plane iron. And I just have magnets underneath that hold it in place. Um, a chisel plane has very few actual uses because you have to be chiseling up to a corner. In other words, a place you can't get a regular plane into because there's something you run into. And it has to be far enough in from the surface that you can't get with a chisel because the handle runs into something. So it's something that is farther in than this, but a wall. But you still need to plane that surface. But you can't get in a shoulder plane because there's another edge to run into. Um, and so there really aren't a lot of places where it comes out. But when you do come to those places, it's pretty much necessity. Um, unless you get good at doing a bevel down chisel, in which case then you can plane like that. But doing bevel down chisel work um, as a plane takes a bit more work, a bit more skill. So, yeah. If you want to see this, it's an old old video making this one. I actually made two different chisel planes. Um, I gave one away and I kept it myself. What's next? All right, last question. Boars woodworking. I joined right when you were talking about the router plane. Where is a good place to look for one? eBay, you know, is eBay and what brand and what iron size? No, eBay, eBay is, yeah, not a great place. That's probably the most expensive place for a router plane. Um, web, I have a website set up for finding antique hand tools called handtoolfinder.com. Um, and on there I have a map of the world with all of my known physical locations of where to buy hand tools, uh, as well as a selection of trusted online sellers. Um, and then below that I have a, a, um, a page for um, groups, so local groups, online groups, Facebook groups, and then I have a section of, um, of organizations, such as the Midwest Tool Collectors. Usually they're clubs that are dedicated to antique hand tools. Um, and so most all the sources ever, anything that I know of is on that one place. Um, so definitely take a look at that and go down through all of that. Um, but eBay, eBay is the place you go to when you need that tool and you don't care what the price is. Or, it's the place where you spend hours and hours and hours and set up all sorts of algorithms to track it and hopefully you'll get lucky um, that someone accidentally misspelled something or has no idea what they do and hasn't written it out well. <laughs> but yeah, most of the time eBay is the more expensive source, for, especially for router planes because those have become so, so pricey that they're, they're hard to find.
Cool. I think that is okay. it. Okay. We got one last question. Okay. One last question. What they were it? very good waiting for you to finish. So I'm going to let them ask it. So Little Gray asks, can you use a putty knife or a painter's scraper as a scraper? Um, you should be able to. It's steel. You want a steel that's a little bit softer than tool steel. Um, so yeah, if you squared one of those up and turned a burr on it, it should do that. Um, usually what most people do is they, well here, I got a couple of them here that I, well, where'd it go? Oh my, both of mine disappeared. Um, generally you make them out of um, um, plain uh, saw blades, old hand saws that are no longer useful. That steel is absolutely perfect with it. You can cut it up with a pair of tin snips and cut to whatever shape, size you want. And it makes fantastic scrapers. I have um, two or three old saw plates that I use for cutting out and making um, specific shape scrapers. And that's a fantastic steel for it. But theoretically, a putty knife should work. Though it'd be kind of hard to handle with the blade on there because you don't actually scrape you would turn it up on its edge and scrape that way. So it might be a little bit more odd to work with the handle, but it should work. So, good question. We have to try that sometime. So this week has been very weird. Um, next week we'll do something a little different. So uh, thank you everyone for hanging out for this. This has been uh, fun. Uh, if you do have a local group that you want me to talk at, let me know. I do do that from time to time and uh, we'll see. So. Yeah, let me know what uh, what you want me to do for the live next week. We'll do something fun. Or is next week the live? Is there a question? No, next week's no, the Q&A. No, I don't think week that's One after that will be the Q&A. We'll do something fun next week. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. There we go. <laughs>